to Influential Visions. Here, we interview futuristic leaders who share their deep industry knowledge and business experience with you, ensuring you have your finger on the pulse and your eyes wide open. My name is Nathaniel Schooler, and I am your host. Thanks for tuning in. So today I'm uh, I'm very privileged to be joined with uh, joined by Kim Adele Randall and Nish Renasinghe again, and we are we are interviewing uh, Fraser Duncan, who has a lot of uh, great knowledge around um, the HR space and also around technology itself. Uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Water. So uh, thanks guys for joining me. I'm really excited to kind of dig deep into the HR subject of human resources today so uh yeah it should be uh, it should be a lot of fun hopefully so uh fraser um do you think there are like massive problems then within within uh, hr gosh uh start with a start with a like trick question there he's like uh, uh no everything's fine <laughs> no uh, is, are there massive problems within hr i think the thing uh that is, is happening in in the world we, we've had uh, a number of massive changes in the next 50, in the last 50 years. Uh, we've had uh, the rise of the computer. We've had the rise of the mobile phone. We've had uh, the rise of uh, the, the internet. All of these have allowed uh, work to change immeasurably uh, o- over that time. And then in the, uh, in the sort of last uh, few years, uh, thanks to, to, to COVID, um, which of course in, in many ways has been, been uh, horrendous, we, we've had a, uh, an almost forced trial of working from home, uh, and and this is not new. That's the, uh, you know I, I can't take credit for that statement. But uh, what what it does uh, does mean um, is is that the the world of work uh, has changed uh, and continues to change uh, incredibly quickly, faster than it's ever changed before. And I think probably then the bigger question is: Are we keeping up? Uh, are we uh, using the tools at our disposal uh, to keep up with the changes in expectations, the changes in input and the changes in output uh, that, that work uh, entails? And I think really the answer there is there's a lot more we can do. Yeah, yeah. So I know you, you've got loads to say around this, Kim. You know well, a lot I, about it. So I guess for me, one of the, the things that, that I've seen over the last... 30 odd years of, of working is that we often we often don't think about the people element of what it is that we're trying to do and we assume that that people element is going to be picked up somewhere else and that's often where perhaps HR gets a bit of a bad rap because they're expected to pick up all the people but the reality is it's the leaders that are there to pick up the people and I think that's been one of the things we've seen in the last couple of years you, you're so right for it. so we've had a um, enforced um, trial of, of remote working but actually that really exposed some of the challenges that we've got because those leaders that weren't very good at being able to connect and engage and enthuse when they were in the office didn't get any better at it when they were suddenly forced to be virtual. And actually you lose some of that more, uh, you know, more human contact. And I think one of the things for me that I think is fascinating is you know, how we help our people adjust to the fast pace of change is in the soft skills, which always makes me smile, because if they were really so soft, why do people find them so hard? (laughs) Because people struggle with the most, doesn't it, is those seemingly soft skills of how we connect. Absolutely. Uh, I think, um, you know, one one of the big things is is having, you know, um, round pegs and round holes and square pegs and square holes. And, um, you know, it's fine. Uh, You know, I, I would be a terrible doctor. Like I'm, I'm absolutely certain I would be a terrible doctor. My neighbor's a doctor and she is clearly a very good doctor. And, and I am aware that that's not me and that's okay because I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to try and be a doctor. Um, and I think this is, is the sort of case, um, you, you know, the, there's a sort of pervasive uh, feeling within, within work that's, that's gone back 200 years that, you know, progression is the, is the ultimate thing. Everyone needs progression. You know, you're told in, you know, people are told by colleges to go to interviews and ask what progression opportunities there are because it makes it seem like you want to stay there. And, you know, it's like, is, is progression at all costs really what we need? Like, is it not just okay to be really good at something and then be rewarded for being really good at that thing? 
And, you know, you look at uh, what I think one of the biggest moves that um, H the HR space has made that, that goes towards fixing uh, that, that problem that, that you mentioned there, um, Kim, is the uh, it, Google, um, you know, Amazon, various uh, sort of Silicon Valley companies initially and, and more beyond, beyond that have totally decoupled um, pay and position. And they say, why, you know, why, why should the manager be paid more than the people they manage? Like, there's, there's no real kind of, like, reason uh, for this. Because what, what tends to happen is, you know, think back to the 2003 World Cup and think back to, you know, David Beckham's having an absolute stonker of a World Cup. And there we are. We just got through to the final. And the FA turns around to, to the, the team and, and says, right, Sven, uh, you know, we're, we're promoting you to director of the FA because you've done so well. And, and David, you're going to be our manager from now on. And it's like, uh, but but we're like what? You've just you've just taken your best player out of the team and put them on top of the team uh, in a job that they don't know how to do so well because of some perceived sort of posterity that that comes from that. And as a result, you've you've made everything worse. Like there's no there's no kind of other way to see it. The best place for David Beckham in the final of the 2003 World Cup was on the pitch. Unfortunately, we are England, and therefore we didn't win. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think if you if you can sort of remove this this pay uh, and and progression kind of uh, coupling, then you can start really focusing on what people are really good at. Like some people are just really good at dealing with customers. So why are you suddenly making them deal with with your staff? You know, some people are are really good at I don't know doing uh, really complex things with code. So why are you suddenly making them team managers? You know, it's, it's the same um, sort of idea. I think if we if we just focus on this round round pegs and round holes, square pegs and square holes, then then that, that ultimately solves a lot of a lot of problems along the way. I love that, and it, it's true that we, we start it so young, don't we? We start at school trying to make everybody an all rounder, and you've got to be good at everything, um, rather than letting people find what is the thing that they're brilliant at, and then turn the volume upon it. And I remember working at Egg back in the late 1990s, and we actually introduced a piece where you could earn as much being one of the phone associates as you could being a team leader, because we wanted to stop our best people in front of customers moving over and being mediocre team leaders, because that wasn't where their skill set was. Um, and you ended up, and I see this in organizations the world over, where instead of having leaders, we have superior friends. You know, I'm in it with you. I just earn a little bit more because I don't really know how to lead you. I don't know to how to have those difficult conversations, but I've been given the title. So you go in that, that stuck space that we need to help them move out of. And I think making those changes, like Google are doing, is going to go some way to being able to really revolutionize how we achieve that, isn't it, and help people find their gift and then really use that gift well. Nish, I know you were about to say something. Yeah, I was just thinking, I totally agree with, with, with what you're saying, both of you are saying, and I think that what we, like, that's the thing, you, you promote your best people in a job to being the managers, and you never take into consideration whether they've ever helped another team member do anything, whether you've, they've ever actually allocated or prioritised anybody's work. Those kinds of, like you mentioned, soft skills, they're so difficult to observe um, within the context of a team. Um, but the best managers do observe that about their team members. And they do know who can, who might actually end up being probably worse potentially at doing the actual day job but better at encouraging other people and training other people and bringing people together and doing all of those things that um, that actually consolidates that team and makes it a high performing unit. Um, and, you know, we I've had an incredible, like incredible experience. I mean, it was a great experience when I was over in Singapore and I was uh, leading the tech consulting firm over there. And we were a young team in the sense of everybody um, and I, I hate to I hate to admit it, but yeah, I I, I realised over there that I am a millennial. Um, I hadn't realised what dates that would that what, what date category that would put me in. But all of us, in fact, from the top, the person who ran the company all the way down, um, we were all millennial, millennials, and we were so we were a young team. And there were people in positions of power or authority figures there who were making real decisions, who didn't have a flipping clue as to how to manage people and get people to do what they would got, get people to do what they should be doing and motivate people. And the biggest uh, change that was made was that a 
HR person was brought in. And like you say, it's just outsourcing that particular problem. That poor HR lady turned up and she was like, hang on a minute, you lot of course <laughs> such a kerfuffle here that I'm now going to have to, I'm now going to have to um, kind of clean up. But it comes from that the cultural aspect of if the, the top of the house isn't um, able to motivate and inspire and bring about the correct culture of the team, an, an HR person is just going to have to uh, do damage control at that point. It's not it's not their job to do this. It's absolutely the leadership. So yeah, totally agree with what you're saying. Absolutely, and I think it's it's so easy to underestimate the effect of this as well. Um, and so I, I always there's a little um, exercise I, I I get people to do. So we'll we'll, we'll do it now. Um, and it, it, if you think back to a job that you hated on a day that you really didn't feel like you did a good job at all or you just couldn't be bothered, whatever. Think of how much work you did on that day. You know, just, just try, and, try and picture that as a sort of entity of how much work you did. And now think of a job that you loved on a day that you went home and you went, oh God, yeah, I was good today. And think of how much you achieved, how much work you did on that day. And the gap between the two is employee engagement. Right? That's, that's what it is. And so, you know, no one should be naive enough to think that we can like all be on top of our game all the time. Like we're human, um, we, we have issues, we have things that happen in our life outside of work, we have things that happen inside of work that shouldn't, you know, whatever. Like we're not going to get to that second uh, sort of idea all the time. But if we can get close, like what can we achieve? Like that's, that, that's in, in, incredible uh, to me. And yet, you know, we, as you say, we, we sort of outsource the problem as though, oh, well, they, yeah, it's a bit of a culture thing. We'll just go and, we'll go and, go and fix that. And it's like, well, actually, like, Christ, like the, the, the team that you, you've got, okay, imagine, imagine two companies that are in a uh, relatively um, traditional business service sector. Choose your own. And um, the, these two companies are uh, a very similar size. Uh, they've been around a relatively similar amount of time. Like they're, they're, on paper, they're, they're, they're pretty much the same. And one of them has just posted their record year, their record earnings. And the other one has just posted a profit warning and said, well, actually, you know, we're, we're not going to achieve what we, we wanted to achieve. What, what's the difference between these two companies? Like they're doing the same thing with the same tools, uh, you know, with the same technology, the same world around them. Like there's the only difference is the people. And that, that's, that's how powerful, like this is happening everywhere, all around us. We're seeing, you know, companies, two companies that on paper should look the same, where one vastly outperforms the other. Um, Cotter and Heskett in the, in the 90s did a, a study with Harvard Business Review where they showed that companies that have a people first mentality outperform over the course of the 11 year study they did they outperformed those that didn't have a people first mentality by a factor of four this these companies were four times bigger after 11 years than those who didn't didn't put them you know like it's just so easy to think oh yeah well you know barry over there is not smiling again you know it's like why like, why is Barry not, not smiling? You know, like, Barry doesn't need to smile all the time, but Barry should at least be proud to come into work and feel that he's going to a place that, is, that cares for him and looks after him and builds up the best in him so that he can give everything that he's got back again. Like, it's a two-way, it's a two-way street. It's, it's so true, Fraser. And I think it's the, sometimes, you know, I used to get it levelled at me all the time. It's all right for you, can you do the fluffy people stuff? <laughs> Brilliant. But let me just tell you what that's done to your bottom line, because actually the bit that they don't always see is not only do you does your performance suffer, but you also start to lose profit margin because your absence goes up, your attrition goes up. You're losing so much of, of the um, of the collateral of, of the organization. And actually, if you get it right for your people, if you make sure that they're engaged and and I always thought as a leader, my only job was to make sure I delivered a good service to my people, because if I didn't, how could I expect them to deliver a good service to, to their people, which were, the, which were the customers? But I think it's, it's how do we get people to really understand that? And there's, uh, you know, there's been research that shows that 57% of people leave their boss, not the organisation. So more than one in two leave you if you're, if you're a leader, if you're managing somebody. More than one in two people that leave are leaving you. Not HR, 
not the company, not the organisation, but you. And actually, the research went on to show that 64% would take a pay cut if we were given a different boss. So the impact that we have as leaders is, is huge. And you know, to your point, the positive that that can have on the overall company, on its performance, is, is immeasurable. Um, but we often get stuck. You know, I went into one organisation recently. They had a 57-page monthly business review and they asked me to like review it which I did and I came and said what's your thoughts and I said it's fascinating 57 pages and not one of them talks about your people um and yet without your people you can't deliver any of this this is just it's just pie in the sky because you they're the ones that are going to deliver it and yet you don't even talk about them it's not the thing that that comes up and yes you could go and get tell me to go and get the HR lady to come in but we're all here we're all leaders we should be able to tell you what's going on with our people what's important to them, what the challenges are, what they you know, what they need to be able to thrive, not just survive. And I think once we make those changes in, in the dialogues that we have at board level, it's going to really shift the culture because one of the number one things that's on board's agendas, the globe over, and it was there before the pandemic and it's there underlined post the pandemic, is how do you attract and retain top talent? But instead of looking to the leadership team and saying, what are we doing? How are we engaging with our people? They outsource that to, to HR. And Nish, to your point, they can't do that because they could build the most amazing culture. But if the leadership team aren't walking the talk, then nobody believes it because they'll go, well, you say trust is important to you. But look what that person's doing over there. And they're in the senior team. So I don't believe that trust is important to you. So it's I think our culture has to be some, something that we, where we walk our talk, you know, where, where our lips and hips actually match. And I think that's the number one change almost that we, that we need to get people to, to recognise. There's, there's a great um, saying, which, um, is, you know, reminds me of a John Lennon quote as well, but it's like, c culture is what happens when you're not looking. <laughs> we, we always sort of think, oh, yeah, well, oh, I mean, everyone tells me everything's fine, so the culture here must be good. But, like, what, what, what happens when you leave? Like when you go on holiday, what happens? Like, and as a leader, like if you go on holiday and you can trust that everyone like actually cares about their job and is going to continue performing in their job, like you can go and have a better holiday. Like this is, you know, this isn't all just like give, give, give. Like you actually do get something back from this. Like you, you get um, a, a warm, fuzzy feeling that actually like these people care about this thing just as much as you do. Yeah, I also think that culture is is such a is such a buzzword at the moment. I don't know when. I don't know when. I don't think it happened just at the, around the pandemic. It was just before that that culture mm -hmm. started coming to the fore. I think when, and when everyone started talking about ping pong tables. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And uh, you know, yeah, we've got a great culture, but exactly the same like that. The company I was, I, you know, I've got so many case studies from this particular company, but they would profess that the company. Uh, the company culture is the best thing. What they meant was, is that we're young, we will bring, you know, the drinks to the table, we'll take our customers out, we'll have, we'll bring the fun to the group. But actually, cult culture underlines, like, underlies values, uh, is underpinned really by values, right? So if, for example, like, we've had something in the company I work for now, whereby, you know, one of our, our kind of values is transparency, uh, like, customer transparency. So when we're discussing a certain, you know, particular event that's happening that is customer related we know that actually there's nothing that we can really hide from them because we want to be upfront we want to we want to perpetuate this transparency and it, it's about like you say trust like okay trust is one of the values but if you've got a particularly controlling leader who sits there like like you're mentioning on their holidays kind of you know constantly sort of like is everyone doing this is everyone doing that that is not trust that that doesn't empower people it doesn't inspire people it doesn't mean mean that People feel as if they are being trusted to do their job correctly, um, and it's so and it's so much simpler than you know spending you know whatever hundreds of hundreds of pounds on a ping pong table and making sure everyone at four o'clock goes and gets a beer or whatever it is. It's so much more than that. It starts off probably with that, and everyone kind of gets it, gets a buzz from all of those fun things. But my goodness, like it's all about those really core people um, people motivations that. That need to be just persisted throughout the whole uh, the company, and that comes down to. I remember we we started thinking about hiring people and doing um, 
people are they called psych not psychometric versus personality testing um you know those disc studies and all that and trying to understand the different relationships and the different people types of people you need in the team forget skill sets and i've always been of the opinion that you don't actually need to know a domain you can be taught a domain when you get into the company mm -hmm. um but for so yeah, except for, except for doctors <laughs> except for doctors and possibly <laughs> coders. <laughs> um, although you say that, you know, my fiance is a doctor, so he'd hate me for saying that. There is also, also Google, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, no, with, um, with uh, yeah, psychometric tests, or uh, not, sorry, not psychometric tests, personality testing to say, right, in our team, this team is lacking an extroverted leader. So forget anyone quiet who comes to the table, <laughs> forget this. <laughs> Let's just, you know, put those off, the, like tick those off slightly and then move on because we know what this team needs. Um, and it's just an interesting concept. We haven't implemented anything like that yet. And I don't think any company that I've worked for has, but um, it would be an interesting sort of, it would be interesting to understand if anyone has, anyone has done something like that. It's well, funny because- Sorry, go, go Kim. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm a Myers-Briggs uh, practitioner. And um, one of the things we do is, is help people in teams and it's about identifying that you can do that. You can go down the 16 bits and go, you need some of these, you need some of those. But actually, if you do the team working properly, you can actually see that unless you have both, um, you miss out on something. You know, it, we did we did an exercise with introverts versus extroverts just because you know you mentioned about that, and it was about a Christmas tree. We gave it to the extroverts, and and oh my goodness, you know, we'd got carols singing, we'd got the fire crackling, you've got the smell of um, you know of nutmeg, and <laughs> you know, they have mince pies were there. They've got a picture of a Christmas tree. Whereas when you went to to ask the introverts to describe it, they could describe the ornaments on it. They could explain what it looked like. Um, so actually, neither one was right. But when you put the two together, you got such an amazing view and you felt like you were there. But if you were in either one on its own, there were gaps. And the reason we did that was to help people realise that we all bring something unique to, to that uh, piece. But what we have to do is be in the play we need to be present we need to be there and we need to be able to bring our view um to whatever it is that we're doing and when we create that when we're able to bring our view and i guess it's a little bit like when we were kids you know we're, ultimately it's the presence we want as in we want you to be there not the presence as in we want to buy you things and i think that's the piece that we're a little bit behind the times with when we think about culture it's you know it keeps coming round. It's cyclical, like most other things. A bit like the eighties, we all hoped that the clothes would stay there and heaven forbid they come out again. But they did. Um, I think the same is true in kind of what happens in businesses and culture. You know, it keeps turning up. But actually, one of the bits is they just want your time. You know, I remember working for one organisation. We had no money. We couldn't give them bonuses or get a um, table tennis table <laughs> we couldn't really afford to survive the week but when you went round you know I used to go around with a tea trolley around all 1200 people and go and make them tea I was the COO so it might okay well, that was a waste of your time okay but it wasn't it was the most valuable time I spent every month because the amount I learned in the organization from being with them at their desk asking what it was like to be them what's going on this month meant they connected with you all month and I ended up getting the CFO, was a very dour Yorkshireman, lovely, lovely guy, come with me eventually, <laughs> took a while, it's like, come on, come with me, and he came, at the end of it, he was like, do you know, I've learned more about the organisation in the last hour than I've learned in the last 13 years, I said, and you will, and you'll continue to learn, because now that they've connected with you, they'll come and tell you when things are stupid, or <laughs> things are like, why do we do this, because it's ridiculous, <laughs> because you've actually spent time and connected with them, and I think that's kind of what people are desperate for isn't it is to feel that connection yeah i mean um I, i'm aware that we're on a technology podcast here ultimately uh, and so i'm going to segue uh, into into what um you know what what we're trying to achieve uh, here because this all all speaks very um closely to our sort of mission as a, as a company water i mean our, our our mission uh is to build a world where everyone's engaged in their work whatever that looks like to different people that's that's not i can't prescribe what that looks like to you or to someone else like that's that's a very individual thing but if we can build a world where everyone feels proud of their of their their input their, the, the world that they they live in and the the, the world that they help create like that's a, a sort of incredible uh, thing that we should be be looking for, and 
one of the things that I've I've seen um, over my my uh, time in, in in work and um, you know also sort of working with my clients is that there isn't a one size fits all culture. There are different cultures. There are different places that have different merits, um, different strengths, different weaknesses that attract different people who all achieve very highly. But the thing that I I am certain of um, is that while cultures can be very different, the the key uh, factor is that is that people genuinely care and don't just say they care, but they they actually care about about what is going on with their culture and, and, and their company. And so um, we were talking uh, a little bit uh, a moment ago about personality testing um, and um, that that sort of thing. I think that's that's a fascinating uh, sort of area and, and an area that, that Water has has dabbled in and, and is continuing to to look into. Um, as far as sort of gathering the data, now what, what what we're trying to do is is say, hey, if if we can look at your team. We can assess through our um, 24 pillars of engagement that we've built. Um, if we can assess where the strengths are, where the weaknesses are, trust is a big one. Um, management is a, is a big one. Uh, sort of loyalty and vision for the company. You know, they're all uh, huge parts of, of that sort of puzzle, uh, along with your, your professional and personal well-being, uh, vitally uh, important. But if we can create, you know, we can accept that, um, you know, this sales team does not look like this tech team, does not look like that marketing team and doesn't look like this customer service team. And that's OK. Like, that's fine. We don't need to try and try and tick these these boxes. And I think one of the, the, the questions, uh, Nish, I think, you know, that, that, that I would uh, have is I, I think it's great to, to try and pick up, you know, what the um, different strengths and weaknesses are in the team. But like how we don't know what perfect looks like. Like we, we don't know that actually a charismatic leader in this area is what we need because charisma takes all sorts of forms. But some of the, some of the greatest leaders uh, in the world were introverts. Um, like there, there isn't as kind of like a set um, mold for what, what that looks like. And, and, and so I think that's a really interesting sort of thing to, you know, and you can use data and you can use AI to, to really try and dig in and find the sort of, the complexities that we as humans just just don't don't spot mm. and yeah that's absolutely you're absolutely right and i think where i've seen it work and you know another company i worked at again we were all uh, done we were given a report so you answer all the questions like it was quite an extensive set of questions and then you get this graph as to where you are on the scale in terms of it's called uh, disc so the disc uh, yeah, so what, what, where, where, I, you know, when, when it first, I'm all, I love all this personality testing, so I was well into it, but I know a lot of people in our management team specifically were quite cynical of it. Now, where it came to, where it was interesting was, I had had a disagreement with some, with a counterpart of mine, we'd had a disagreement over a customer um, about how it was handled, all these sorts of things, and we'd, we came, come to a bit of an impasse in terms of how, in, how to, how to come to an agreement on what to do next. And what, um, what, this is what the HR team did actually, they uh, compared our profiles. They did a comparison report and basically gave, handed it to each of us. And it was kind of like, okay, this is how you work with this person. And that, that person got my one as well. And in this report was, the, these are the things that it's important to him. These are the things that are important to you. You guys are on these two ends of the scale. And honestly, like we got together after that and we kind of, we got, we got, went to the pub or something like that afterwards and we were like, right, well, this is bloody interesting, right? And, um, and we, and it was able to, I'm in, in some binary format, um, help us to understand our differences. Another thing that Myers Briggs did, I, I think I, I did a very, very small Myers Briggs uh, study in a group that I was working with um, way back when. And that again showed that the whole team was totally different. And it is, it is about understanding your differences and learning to work with each other, what your motivations are. And I think those types of technology and personality, whatever it is, um, trying to map engagement, trying to understand um, how, how people might uh, interact or how, what motivates people and trying to sort of map that out and then presenting it back to them and saying, look, there's nothing that you actually fundamentally don't have anything that you're butting heads about. You're both coming from a place that you want to do the right thing, but your backgrounds mean that you value this versus he values this. Therefore, you will butt heads on this. And it was a really great actually tool to get us to actually resolve that issue. And I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant use of technology in HR. Um, 
so yeah like that i mean anything that sort of is able to map out um you know people do those employment surveys i don't know how great they are but um, <laughs> engagement surveys where it's like did you like did you like us giving you a free lunch last week yay or last friday of every month everyone gets a free lunch um and that's what ends up happening with those right so anyway it's just an interesting interesting I think, I think you're right but i think with engagement surveys it's what you do with them afterwards isn't it and i think with, like with my Briggs, with disc with all of them all they do is is tell us how we're likely to uh, respond under pressure because it doesn't mean you can't change you know if you if you are an extrovert it doesn't mean to say you can't have moments of being introverted or or vice versa um it's about saying un, under pressure and you know the, the way um that i always used to describe it was your 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 preference and their preferences not strengths or weaknesses there's no right or wrong your preference is the driver in the car so imagine you're in the car you've got the driver you've got the passenger you've got the teenager and you've got the baby and it's just about how well developed they are so your driver your preference is the one that is the most competent but when you start to get a little bit stuck you move to the passenger to help navigate they're the map reader can't work out which way to go tell me where it is um, and then occasionally a teenager will want to put the music on and hopefully the baby stays asleep because we all know when the baby wakes up, everybody is looking at them because they're, you know, because they're very upset. They're going to shout and scream. And that's basically what our preferences do. So our least developed, our baby preference is the one that comes out under pressure. So all these things do is help us understand how we are. Um, uncertain situations and then with technology we can help share that with other people to say and this great, great point I've done it myself with somebody where we got on famously outside of work but in work we used to have a real impasse because he wanted me to fill in 500 sheets and that's not really my style I'm like, I'm like just get on and do it I'm like, Shh, don't tell anyone about that I've told you don't tell anyone about that Kim <laughs> Once we had a conversation where I was like, right, okay, how do we find a way through this? Because the thought of sitting and filling in that spreadsheet fills me with utter dread. But I know you need it to be able to feel that you're in control of what's going on. So we found a compromise and it was it was that technology, it was that infrastructure that allowed us to work through the conversation. And I think for me, they're the bits that are really interesting about what's going to happen next in the tech space within not within the HR space, but within the people space, because I think we we need to take away the label. In every organisation, it's people. And you know, we, we hear people say it's really, you know, it's really complicated. I've got all these, I've got customers, I've got suppliers, I've got colleagues. They're all people. Every one of them is a person. At the end of the day, all the people using the technology are people. When you get to the end of the line, and I think now that there are so many things that we already have, like the personality pieces, like uh, reading micro expressions and emotions, understanding data science, it could hopefully help us break down some of the you know, some of the chances where conflict comes up. And I, you know, I think for me, what would be really interesting is to have a conflict revolution instead of resolution, where we look at conflict as an opportunity to learn and grow about each other because that's all it is you're normally coming from a good place you've just got a misunderstanding and it's how do we help use the the technology and the infrastructure to remove those misunderstandings and get people aligned and engaged because i think we want to be listened to understood and respected and i think that's why it's, there's so such differences as you said fraser in what a leader looks like but for me the commonality of good leaders is those people irrelevant of how they are, <laughs> whether they're extrovert, introvert, whatever that is, is that they provide a space where they listen, understand and respect the people that work for them. Um, and that's, I think, what, what really drives that engagement. That's very interesting. You've got thanks, guys, for this this masterclass. I've just been sitting here, like just mulling over what you what you've been saying, you know. And I mean, I've been I've been kind of studying tech for the past few years. Um and had a very interesting conversation around how you could actually use the data and, and use the data in terms of which jobs are actually dying out, which jobs are actually going to be coming on board in the next five years, two years, three years, 10 years. And then, you know, uh, uh, and put together, you know, if you can combine that data from customer uh, engagement, you can you can combine that data with oh, well, I'm not really interested in in what's going on here. And I'm not sure about this job. Uh, you know, is a salesperson actually going to be 
in sales in the next five years, just as a potential example, right? So these kind of jobs, I believe, are, are actually dying out in many cases. Obviously, there are going to be exceptions, but they're in so many industries, it's all changing. And then if you put together the personality insights, you put together the ambition, because I think ambition, motivation, drive, if you can if you can think about those and say, well, okay, this person over here, they're not driven by what you think they're driven by, right? And actually, they're perfectly happy doing that particular thing that they're doing, and they really enjoy it, but that's not going to be around anymore. So how are you going to find the next thing that they're going to love to do and then if you can align all these things with people in in the third world in uh in developing economies and you can you can perhaps guide them on on and coach them into you know p- potentially new jobs that don't even exist yet and you can say to them well we think based on our data that this particular job is going to be around in the next two three years this sector is growing massively. It's like cybersecurity, for example. So I'm hugely excited about it. I you you put all these pieces together, and we are we're really going to be um, changing the world. Actually, absolutely. I think the the biggest move in technology in the last few years, um, the, the the biggest thing that's that's going to revolutionise the world more and more is access to data. Um, we've talked about a, a lot of amazing uh, things that, that you know, should, should be done in the workplace. We, we totally, uh, you know, agree. And, and being able to understand each other is, is so important. Being able to communicate with each other is so important. What we have now that we've never had before is an ability to, to use data to, to really get down onto, onto a whole new level about whether that works. I'm convinced that no one ever turned around and said the annual survey is the best we we could possibly have like no one has ever optimized the annual employee survey and all and, and I'm, I'm convinced that the conversation that spawned it was sort of like we should probably go and ask these people what their experience is because they're a big part of our company um but in order to do that we have to go and design a survey or pay lots of money uh and uh, we don't want to do that too often because that sounds like hard work and we don't really know what we're looking at when the data comes back in. So we'll do a sort of analysis, but like we're not statisticians, we're, you know, we're people people. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll go and make a load of decisions uh, and we'll pass it via the, the board because, you know, everything majors come up because we've only asked it once a year. So we'll go and talk about it at board level and then, and then five months pass and, and people start to go, oh, yeah, well, maybe we should put some fruit in the office. And... Um, and if you, um, you know, this is a, just a totally underwhelming experience to be on the receiving end of. Uh, and so, um, you know, sort of shameless uh, plug almost here. But uh, with with a platform like like Water, what you can do is is keep a, a constant pulse uh, on, on what's happening. And, and we take away all of those bits that are painful and difficult about the annual survey. You don't have to write it yourself because we went and got psychologists to do it. You don't have to do the the analysis yourself because we went and got statisticians to do it. Like all that happens is we create this this um, sort of safe space where people can air the the truth about their their day to day lives, their day to day work. I mean, don't forget we spend more time at work than we spend with our partners. Like when was it acceptable to turn around and say, yeah, but work's work. Like, uh, no one enjoys work. Like, uh, it's just a thing that you have to do. I mean, it's a thing that you have to do for 40 hours a week, most people, uh, if not more. Uh, uh, and so, you know, if, if we can constantly create a feedback loop and use the data and use analytics and use AI to really understand whether the things that we're talking about, that we're all agreeing are so important, whether they're working, whether they're having an effect, whether we're solving problems for people and whether ultimately they are coming into work more like, as I've mentioned that thought experiment earlier, more like that, that second camp where they come in and they think, oh my God, I was good today. Like I was, I was great. Like that's what we should all be aiming for. And I don't understand where, somewhere along the, the, the lines, this, this got muddied into, into like, oh yeah, but work's work. And, uh, yeah, that's true, I, Fraser. I'm but I'm afraid I'm going to have to I'm going to have to cut you short because <laughs> we got to rush because uh, I think Kim's got to run to a meeting and uh, we've gone way over our time. But it's been it's been so <laughs> interesting to listen to you guys and thank you so much, all of you, for 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 coming along and sharing your sharing your insights around this. I thoroughly enjoy speaking with you always. So uh, thanks. Pleasure. Thanks so much, guys.
Thanks very much for listening. Please make sure you share this episode with your friends and business connections. And don't forget to drop us a review wherever you listen.